One thing I forgot to mention uh, is tonight after the hub, uh, 5 p.m. in our service, if you notice in the bulletin, I put it down as um, a continuing our St. John's Park Baptist Church School of Theology. And in particular, because it's Missions Month, I want to help you uh, with some evangelism training, maybe some apologetical training. Uh, we won't hit both of those tonight. But if uh, you want some evangelism training, again, just to remind you, you're all missionaries. Um, you're all evangelists. And I, I know sometimes, uh, I know you know that, but sometimes it's difficult to break the ice or even be confident uh, in, in your evangelism. And so if that sounds like something you might need some help in, I, I encourage you to be back here tonight at 5. Uh, be back for the hub and just stick around um, uh, for that at 5 o'clock, okay? And now this morning, uh, take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 1. It is Missions Month, and uh, we, we've July being Missions Month over the last whatever number of years. Normally, whatever book we're studying, I kind of stop, put, you, put that to the side and bring in a message related to missions. Um, but I'm able to stay in Hebrews. We've been studying Hebrews for, for quite a while now. Last week, we wrapped up uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 26 to 31 and related it to missions. Uh, obviously, that's a warning. And part of our job as missionaries is to uh, tell people to flee the wrath to come. And uh, there in, in, in that, those verses there at the end of Hebrews 10, there's a warning, a warning of those, uh, certainly to unbelievers, but warning to those who once said they did believe, but no longer believed. And uh, the, the language is pretty strong. Um, if you find yourself in that category of, being under the gospel, knowing the gospel, that, but then willfully, deliberately rejecting the gospel, uh, in the end there will be, and remember our outline from last week, there will be no forgiveness for you. There'll be no forgiveness, there'll be no mercy, there'll be no grace, there'll be no peace, only uh, wrath because ultimately you will be falling, and it's a terrifying thing to do this, to fall into the hands of a living God. So it's a bit of a reality check that, that you will live forever. And um, you will live forever either in God's favorable presence or his unfavorable presence. And the difference between the two is what? One has a mediator and one does not. That's the difference between heaven and hell. One has a mediator and one does not. You will be in the presence of God forever because God is omnipresent he fills, how many Bible verses does he himself say, I fill the heavens and the earth. He fit, there, there's no place that he hasn't created that he kind of decides to step back from. Hell is a created place, and he is there. Uh, and if you are going to find yourself there, you're going to find yourself in his unfavorable presence because you have sinned against him, a thrice holy God. Now, all of that to say is I want to stay on the subject of missions this month, and I want to stay in the book of Hebrews. I've been reading a book, and I mentioned this last week, uh, reading a brand new book that was titled um, Reading Hebrews Missiologically. I can't believe I said that without stuttering. Reading Hebrews, here I go again, reading Hebrews missiologically, that, that is reading the book of Hebrews with a, a, a missionary lens. Um, it's a contributed book. It's a number of different authors take different angles relating the book of Hebrews to missions. And as I read it, and it's, it's, it's a decent book it, in the chapters that I read, it pulls out that, you know, the book of Hebrews has subjects such as uh, sin and death and guilt uh, and sacrifice and uh, salvation and savior and, and all those things that are related to the gospel. So, of course, it's going to be missiological because that's what a missionary does. He's is sent with, with the gospel. But of course, I took a step back thinking, well, what book isn't missiological then? <laughs> Every book of the Bible, in a sense, is missiological. But it was, it, was, it was good. It was a good reminder that we didn't have to depart from the book of Hebrews in order to talk about missions. This morning, however, I, I want to not speak on something specific. I want to take a step back and, and really talk about, discuss where Missions Begins. I don't know if you noticed the title in your bulletin. It's called The Missio Dei and the Book of Hebrews. 
The missio dei is just a fancy Latin term that the theologians use. It's translated the mission of God. So before we talk about um, you and I as missionaries, we talk even about um, specifically the gospel and all the aspects of the gospel, we go all the way back to where missions begins, and it begins in the very throne room of God. That's where it all begins. And you can see it very, from the very first two verses of Hebrews chapter 1. Look at it. God, this is how he begins the book. God, having spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days spoke to us in his Son. Now, you read that text, and you're familiar with tech, that text. That, that's, that's a text on what we call divine revelation, right? That this is divine revelation, that, that God speaks. He spoke in the Old Testament. He speaks in the New Testament. He spoke in the Old Testament. How? In the prophets, or by the prophets. Now, notice he spoke to the fathers. That's, let's say, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But how did he speak to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Well, he sent a prophet. That sounds like a missionary. That's the Missio Dei. Biblical revelation. And this is something to think about. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. That mission is not only on the central theme of divine revelation, but it's also on the, really, the structure of divine revelation. Here is God sending his word, and we often talk about this, God sent his word, God sent his word. We've been reading the book of Acts, and, and, and the apostles are sent out, and, and we follow the, the apostle Paul, and, and, and Luke, after, and almost at every chapter, talks about how the word of God went forth, and what it did, right? Went forth, sent. That, that sounds like mission. But where does it all begin? It begins with God sending his word to the prophets in, sorry, to the fathers rather, in the prophets in many portions and ways. But this, these days he speaks through his what? His son. In other words, God still sent his word, but his final word was through his son. So yes, this is on the subject of biblical revelation, divine revelation, but divine revelation begins where? In the throne room of God. Now, when I say the structure of revelation, some of you have been reading uh, my PhD thesis. You still going? You still going? You, you still have sleep issues. Is that why you're reading it? Okay, good. All right. uh, I, and I always say, if you have some sleep issues, I'll send you my thesis. I'll put you right to sleep. But my, my thesis, if you've, if, if you've read it, and I've mentioned it over whatever weeks, if not years, has to do on this very subject. I mean, when you read in the prophets or by the prophets, there, there's a metaphor that comes out. In the ancient Near East, when a king, let's pick one, King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, he's got this vast Babylonian empire. And how do you administrate that empire? Yeah, there's, there's no phones, there's no internet, there's no TV. No, he, he divides the empire up into sections and he puts governors over each section. But if he wants to get a word to his governors, what does he do? How, how, do, how do you get your word as the king, the word of the king, to the people of God? What do you do? You, you, back then, you would write it on a clay tablet, and you take that little tablet, and you would give it to who? You would give it to a messenger. And that messenger would then be dispatched from Babylon to wherever, and maybe there's a number of different messengers, dispatched throughout the kingdom, and they would walk into that town, and they would what? Thus saith the king. Right? That's how the king would administrate his kingdom, by sending out his missionaries his messengers, with a message. Now, that's biblical revelation. God in his eternal throne sends out his missionaries, his messengers, his prophets, by the hand, by the hand of the prophets, with a message, and they come to the fathers and say what? Thus saith the Lord. That's, that's the structure. That's the analogy that the Bible uses in helping us understand how God is a missionary, how God sends his word. In fact, this week I was reading in Chronicles, and I noticed that some of the kings, namely David, 
when David became king, he would send some of the priests out to some of the remote cities. And why would he send priests with a mission? And it says, to teach the people. That's what a Levite did. That's what the priests did. They, they taught the people. And so while they may be, you know, in their Jerusalem, and in, in their schools and, and, and in the temple, the, the people out on the periphery, those who don't really know the Lord but need to be taught the Lord, David sends out the priests. The priests act as missionaries. In fact, it's, it's called a, a, a missionary task. They, as messengers, with the word of God, go out to the people to teach them. And guess what? Nothing's changed. That's missions. That's what we do. There's, there's unreached people who don't know Yahweh, that don't know the Lord, don't know Christ, lost in their sins. And so we send people out primarily to what? To teach them. That's what a, that's what a minister is. That's what you and I are. Israel was a kingdom of priests. Remember at the Exodus 19? He says, you will be to me a kingdom of priests. Now, it was a kingdom with priests, but collectively, they were to be a kingdom of priests because everybody in that kingdom, every single Israelite was to be a quote-unquote priest. And what does the priest do? He teaches. That's, what it, that's why they were scattered throughout the country. They, they were the resident teachers. And we know all of that. But sometimes we don't connect it back to where it all began. And this is my point. This, this begins with God. The Missio Deo is made up. Watch this. Let me just break it down for you. The, the Missio Deo is made up of God as king. The missionaries are his agents. And they are sent out on a mission primarily to administrate his kingdom. Did you catch that? I came across this uh, definition of missions. Uh, a, a lot of missiologists out there and, and, and trying to study missions and, um, and they come up with their own definitions and a lot of bad ones out there, but I thought this one was pretty good. This definition says, a missionary is a prepared disciple, and I like that. We don't send anybody. We some, send someone who is prepared, who's not just called, but equipped, trained, before the disciples were apostles, or yeah, before they were apostles, they were disciples. They were learners for three years, and then they were sent out. They, they, they had their own little Bible college with Jesus for three years, right? Same idea here. A missionary, let me finish this. A missionary is a prepared disciple whom God sends into the world with his resources, his word primarily, to make more disciples for his kingdom. Short, sweet, and, and, and succinct, very good. A missionary is a prepared disciple whom God sends into the world with his resources to make more disciples for his kingdom. So what does that mean? It means that the world, universe, but we're, we're not out there. We're here on this planet. So the earth is God's kingdom. God is king. To advance his kingdom, to administrate his kingdom, he sends out his missionaries. Now, if, 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 if missionary, as soon as you hear that word, uh, uh, just kind of defaults to, you know, the, the Joneses or the, the Luxfords or, you know, somebody you know that's packed their bags and moved overseas, let me use another word. Messengers. If you want another word, Ambassadors. You want another word? Evangelists. They're, they're all synonymous. So, a missionary is a prepared disciple. An evangelist is a prepared disciple. A, a, an ambassador is a prepared disciple. A messenger, that, that's, that's actually using biblical languages. They were messengers sent by the king, whom God sends into the world with his resources to make more disciples for his kingdom or to administrate his kingdom. So the very foundation of theology, which is biblical revelation, is connected to the mission of God. And you see that right there in the first verse. You see how that's connected? 
And so he spoke to the fathers by the prophets in the hand of the prophets. Literally, that's the metaphor. They have a message in their hand. Now, we could talk about many portions in many ways. How did he speak to the prophets? That's one of the questions I wrestle with in the thesis. We know God spoke, but how did he speak? But then finish the verse. But in these days, that's how it was in the old days, but in these days, he spoke to us through who? In his son. What does that tell you? It tells you that the son, and we know who the son is, is a missionary. It tells us that the son was what? A messenger. A messenger of the Lord. Or as it's put in the Old Testament, an angel of the Lord. But he's a messenger of Yahweh. So, the theme of mission, the theme of mes- mission, the theme of the mission of God, listen, is not just behind divine revelation in the Old Testament, but the mission of God is behind also the revelation in the New Testament as well. And what is the whole point of revelation? Why has God given us his word? Well, he's given us word to, to reveal to himself, reveal ourselves, and show the great chasm between us and him with the plan of salvation. But the ultimate big picture reason why he sent his revelation was to administer his kingdom, to bring those into the kingdom and to administer that kingdom. That makes sense? Now that was just introduction. What we want to do now is connect Hebrews 1, 2, turn the page to Hebrews 3, 1. Because now we, now we kind of, it's still on the same subject, but turn the corner a bit. Notice Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, holy brethren, so he's talking to his readers, that we can include ourselves if we're Christians. Holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, do this. What is it? Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you you know there's a number of different names that can be given to Jesus, right? This is the only place in the whole Bible that calls him the apostle. Now, high priest, that's the whole book of Hebrews for that matter, and we, we know that now that we're in Hebrews 10. This is the first reference, but the, the rest of the, the book, actually back in Hebrews 2 he does, but the rest of the, of the book, the bulk of the book of Hebrews is arguing that Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is the high priest we what? Need. Not like the Jewish high priest. We need this kind of high priest. We need the high priest as we talked about in the catechism that's what? Holy, harmless, and undefiled. Because we need a high priest that's going to intercede on our behalf. Not a human one. But Jesus the apostle, isn't that interesting? I mean, the 12 that he called were 12 apostles. But he here himself is called an apostle. Now, the the 12, just just to to flesh this out a bit, the the, the 12 that he called to himself, he called them, uh, well, they're, they're called the disciples, right? Before they became the 12 apostles. What's a disciple? A disciple is a learner. And that's what I said earlier. They learn. They walked and talked and studied their their, their disciples. Every minister of the gospel has some form of training before he is sent out and proclaims, thus saith the Lord. And the paradigm is that three years, even Paul went three years after he got converted and came back. Remember, he was three years in Arabia before he came back and started becoming an apostle. But before they became an apostle, they were disciples. And once they were Finished with their learning, Jesus sent them out. That's what an apostle is. What's an apostle? An apostle is literally, apostolon means one who is sent out. And there you have your missionary connection there, right? Apostle is someone who is sent out. Now, by the way, footnote, isn't it interesting that Jesus is the apostle. He is the one that was sent. Sent by who? Sent by God. Sent by God the Father. But... It wasn't until he was sent out that he became a disciple. Flip it around. 
Remember in Hebrews 5.8, he learned obedience through suffering. Um, and, and you go to Hebrews 5, there's a number of different texts that he brings in from Isaiah that talks about how he, he wakes up every morning to hear the word of God so that he can minister the word of God. And so th in that sense, he was first sent out and then became a disciple. But nevertheless, this, this, this idea that Jesus is the apostle, Jesus is the sent one, we've got to connect that with missions. Again, when we talk about missions, you got to, the whole structure and understanding of missions begins in the very throne room of God, the missio Dei. I mean, we can talk about the method of missions. We can talk about the messenger of missions. We can talk about the message of missions. We can even talk about the motivations of missions. But where it all begins and where you need to have some control in understanding all of that is right there in the very throne room of God. There is God the Father, God the King, and wanting to administrate his kingdom. In fact, I think I remember reading, you know, in the beginning, the, the Trinity said, let us make man in our image. Let us create man in our image. And in the end, the Trinity has said, let us go rescue man for our kingdom. It's ultimately a Trinitarian act. There's the God the Father sending God the Son. And in fact, you go back to, don't turn there, you, you go back to Isaiah 47, but then you read into 48, and I decided not to read 48, but just 47. But if you go into 48, verse 16, you read, Approach me and listen to this. From the beginning I have not spoken in secret. From time anything existed, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. There's the Trinity right there. Mark it. Isaiah 48, 16. The Lord God, the Father, has sent me, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Sent is the key word there. Missions. So here we have, in Hebrews 3, 1, consider Jesus the Apostle. Jesus the the sent one. Now, Jesus himself described himself in a number of different ways. Son of man, son of God. But it's interesting, he never referred to himself as the apostle, but he did describe himself a number of times as the sent one. Let me wake you up for a moment. Turn to the Gospel of John. Let me show you this. I think, I think you'll, you'll find this interesting. How many times? You might have one or two verses in your head, but you, you, you'll find remarkable how many times uh, this whole sent language is in the Gospel of John. Start with John 3, verse 34. Go to, go to John 3, verse 34. Here's Jesus. For he whom God has sent, who's that? Well, whoever he is, speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Go one chapter to four, verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him, here it is, who sent me and to accomplish his work. Chapter 5, verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father, what? Has sent me. And the Father who sent me, has, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him who he sent. Go over to chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Down to verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this, verse 39, is the will who sent me, of him who sent me, that all of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Down to verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Chapter 7, verse 18. 
He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. Go down to chapter 7. I'm going to just skip a few here. Verse 33, 7 verse 33. Therefore Jesus said, for a little while longer I am with you, then I go. I go back. I go to him who sent me. Chapter 8, verse 18. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Go down to chapter 9, verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Let's skip a few down to chapter 12, verse 45. 1245, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. 1320, truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whoever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Isn't that interesting? See the missions, the mission of Jesus and the mission of God in that verse? Jesus sends, and he's sending because God sent him. Isn't that good? See the missionary language in that verse? Go, to, go over to chapter 14, verse 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Go over to John 17, because the sent language is all over 17. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer, remember, in the garden? Starting with verse, eight, uh, sorry, verse 3. John 17, 3, this is eternal life. I love that. You want eternal life? This is it. Now, whether you want to call this a definition or a description, you get to the same place. This is eternal life. And what's eternal life? That they may know you. This is Jesus praying. That may know you. That's God, the only true God. But not just the true God. Here it is. And Jesus Christ. And who's Jesus Christ? Whom you have sent. Verse 8. For the words you gave me, I've given to them, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Again, there's the missionary call. That's the equivalent of the Matthew 28 of the Great Commission. You've sent me. I've trained them up. I've given, you, I've given them your word. I've given them the commission, and they go. They go. They're into the world. Last one. John 20, verse 21. And here, here is, you could say, is the great commission of John. This is where the disciples become apostles. He says, so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you you. Where does missions begin? Where does the missio day begin? It begins in the throne room of God when God the Father sent the Son, sent the Son to do what? How many times did you read the work of the Father? I came to do the work of the Father. And what's the work of the, of the Father? Well, it's in a word to die so that there can be reconciliation. So when we talk about Jesus being sent, Jesus being a missionary, well, who, who sent him? Well, that's, uh, we, we read it's God the Father. God the Father. But, but I would even suggest that we need to go a little bit further and say that the whole idea of the mission of God is a, is, is, is a Trinitarian act, not just one member of the Trinity. It, it was God the Son, God the, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It was a missionary act. Mission of God is a tri-union act of God. J.I. Packer's well-known quip says this, the Trinity, listen to this, I love this, the Trinity is the basis of the gospel, and the gospel is a declaration of the Trinity in action. I just spent this last week in Samuel Baptist Church at a school of theology. They run a school of theology course every week, uh, and they brought out James Dalzell, who's a American theologian, uh, very impressed with him. Um, he is a master seminary grad, of course, so that's why I was impressed. But um, man, he, 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 he was on another planet um, 
giving arguments for the existence of God and just dealing with the simplicity of God, the impassibility. I mean, things that, you, you know, I mean, I just got a PhD and I didn't know what he was saying. It, it, was, it was quite remarkable. Um, but when he got to the whole discussion of Trinity, I, 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 we had a card going around. I just said, James, thank you for enlarging our gratitude to God by enlarging our understanding of God. I mean, that's, that's how I walked away. I didn't grab everything, and thankfully the notes were full, and I'll go through them again. But just the, to sit down and meditate on God, one God with three beings, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, I don't understand it. And, and, and it's hard to articulate, but I do take it upon faith because that's exactly what the Bible teaches. And you can even see it right here with the mission of God. God the Father sending God the Son. And as we read in Isaiah 48, as we know in the New Testament, and the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes when? Afterwards. Remember Jesus says, it's good that I go. It's, it's to your advantage that I go because if I go, then what? The Spirit comes. J.C. Ryle likewise says this, it was the whole trinity at the beginning of creation. Oh, this is the quote I was referring to earlier. It, it was the whole trinity at the beginning of creation that said, let us make man. And it was the whole trinity again, which at the beginning of the gospel seemed to say, let us save man. The trinity at the beginning, trinity at the end. So when we're talking about the mission of God, we're talking about the, 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 the mission of the the triune God. But here, back to Hebrews 3, Jesus the apostle, Jesus the sent one, sent by the fathers. By the way, you notice, just to put, put it, the whole verse together, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest, but what's at the end there? Of our confession. You might have our, our profession, our acknowledgement. It, it means that th th this, this is orthodox. Here we are 2024 and we're on the, on the shoulders of church fathers, early fathers, late fathers, all the patristics, even up to the Reformation, the Puritans. and This is what we all believed. If you are a true orthodox Christian, this is our confession. We believe that Jesus is the apostle and our high priest. That's what he's saying there. It was theirs. It's ours. It's of every Christian. This is what you have to believe. One confession. All the same. He is the apostle and he is the high priest. In fact, here's a thought. You could put it this way. Jesus, the apostle, Jesus, the sent one, was sent to be the high priest. Did you catch that? I mean, you can separate them, Jesus, the apostle, Jesus, the high priest, and they two stand alone on their end. But you put them together, Jesus was sent to be the high priest. And remember, how many times throughout the book of Hebrews, we, we, this is the high priest we need. We need a high priest. We have a sin issue. A sin issue needs to be dealt with. A sin issue is dealt with by a sacrifice, but a priest deals with the sacrifice. And in the Old Testament, in Judaism, there was the sacrifice. There was the blood of bulls and goats, and there were the priests and the high priests. And once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and, and make atonement, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, on behalf of the people, just so that God would dwell with his people. It was a, it was a temporal forgiveness. It was a temporal atonement, but it never took away sins forever. It wasn't an eternal atonement. And Jesus was sent. Not just to be the high priest, but to be also what? The sacrifice. Isn't that amazing? He was the sacrifice and the high priest. This is our confession. Jesus is sent one to be the high priest. Now, just, just out of interest, you might ask, just jumping into the Hebrews 3, 1, why, why, why is he saying this here? Right? Why is he, you know, we're here all the way in Hebrews 10, and we did discuss this way back in Hebrews 3, but that was a long time ago. So just to remind you, what, why is he saying this here? Why, why does he bring up Jesus the apostle here? 
Why, why, why do we have to know that he was the sent one here? Now, when he says the high priest, it's a little bit of a precursor of everything he's going to say, especially from chapter 7 to chapter 10, but basically the whole book. Well, you notice at the beginning of that verse, you have a therefore, and we always ask, what's the therefore, therefore? Uh, that takes you all the way back into chapter 2, and just take your eyes up to verse 14. Go back up to chapter 2, verse 14. And this ties into what we said in the, Heidel, in the question of the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common. Now, that's true, right? You got, you got flesh and blood? I got flesh and blood. So we're going to need a substitute that's what? If our sins are going to be forgiven. It's got to be flesh and blood as well. Now, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, uh, in heaven didn't have flesh and blood. But he became incarnate. John 1, right? And this is the point here. Jesus also shared in these. Why? So that through his death. Now that's key. And we've said this over and over again, and this is the gospel, and we love hearing the gospel all over again, so I'm going to say it again. The reason why the Son of God became incarnate was so that he could be flesh and blood, and by being flesh and blood, he could die. And he we, we needed him to die, otherwise none of us would have salvation. Back to the catechism, who's going to die for you? I can't die for you, you can't die for me. We need someone who's what? Truly righteous and holy. And that's his point here. He shared in common, shared in these, that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those, that's us, who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death, for it is clear that he does not reach out to help out angels. And that's a no-duh. Angels aren't, at least the, the, the rebellious angels, they're not salvable. There's no, no salvation for rebellious angels. He didn't become an angel. He's not an angel. That's the whole argument of the book of chapter 2, that he's better than angels. Uh, but he became incarnate, here it is, to help who? Abraham's seed, Abraham's offspring. And therefore, verse 17, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest matters in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of people. Stop there for a moment. There's that missionary language, right? He had to be like his brothers and sisters. He was sent to be like his brothers and sisters in every way. Why? So that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. So put those two back together in Hebrews 3.1. He was sent. He was sent to be incarnate. He became incarnate so he could be a faithful high priest. You see that? You could say he was sent to reconcile. He was sent to restore so reconciliation, restoration, but first what? Incarnation. Does that make sense? He had to be sent to be incarnate, and to be incarnate was then on to the work of the Father who sent him, and that was the work of reconciliation, restoration through his death. By becoming a man and suffering, by becoming a man and dying, he fulfilled the mission of God, the Missio Dei. Now, just a couple minutes left, and, and I want to run through this. The one thing that's missing that we haven't talked about in this verse, and there's a lot of things we haven't talked about in this verse, but before Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, what's the word that is right before that. Consider. And I like to think that we've done that in the last 40 so minutes. We're considering Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. We're considering the mission of God. But let's, let's unpack that a bit more. The word consider, by the way, could be translated uh, to think, think carefully, think thoughtfully, meditate, chew on. 
That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. You, the Christian, sit down and chew on the very thought that God the Son became an apostle that sent by the Father in order to be the high priest, the high priest that you need. Have you done that lately? Well, what does that mean? Well, I, I actually sat down and jotted a few things. So uh, let me just do this real quickly and we'll wrap this up. Here's some meditations of why Jesus was sent. Do the work of the Father, but let's unpack that a little bit. Here, here's one. Jesus Christ was sent into the world to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.5, right? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. That's what Paul said. Why did Jesus come? Why was Jesus the apostle? He came to save sinners. Secondly, Jesus Christ was sent into the world to bring light to a dark world. Jesus himself said in John 12, 46, I have come as light into the world. I've come as, as, as light unto the world. This is one of my favorite ones. Number three, Jesus Christ was sent into the world to bear witness to the truth. I say favorite because in the light of all the lies, 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 lies in the world today, uh, you, there needs to be some light in this world and, and light and truth go hand in hand. Jesus said in John 18, 37 to Pilate, are you a, Pilate says to Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus says, you rightly say that I am a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. And how many times throughout the Gospels, he, he begins a statement by truly, truly. Remember that? Truly, truly. You know how you could translate that? I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. He, 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 he prefaced everything by saying, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. And you know what? This world is, 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 is hurting for, for, for some truth at the moment. And as Jesus came to tell the truth, he turns around and sends us to do what? To tell the truth. We are his voice in telling the truth. This is the mission of God. Number four, Jesus Christ was sent into the world to destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews says that, 1 John 3, 8 says that. Jesus Christ, number five, was sent into the world to give eternal life. Number six, Jesus Christ was sent into the world to bring great joy. Number seven, Jesus Christ was sent into the world to fulfill the law and prophets. In, order, in, in other words, you understand, in a real sense, Jesus was sent into the world to die the death that you should have died because you were in debt. But he also lived the life that you couldn't live under the law perfectly as well. Theologians talk about the, the active obedience and the passive obedience of Jesus Christ. Number eight, Jesus Christ was sent into the world to reveal God's love for sinners. That's in the verse that most people know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the what? World that he gave his only begotten sons, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we normally stop at that. The very next verse says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. I'll do that the second time. But the first time, but the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not condemned already, but he that uh, is not believed on the only name, begotten, name of the only begotten son of God. In other words, you say, I, I, I don't know God. Most people on the, on, on the planet you know, you ask them, what do you think of God? They'll think he's some cosmic killjoy. They'll think he's no good. And, and normally they don't think he's any good because oh, they haven't, he hasn't given me what I wanted. And all the hunger, all the violence, all the wars, if, you know, I don't want to believe in a God that allows all that. Well, you can't blame him. The Bible's very clear on that. That's man. Man causes wars. It's his heart. Heart's the issue. But if you actually read the Bible... And you really kind of take a look at your life. There's probably more goodness in your life than there is trouble. You, you enjoy a good meal, enjoy the, the, the love of a spouse, you, the, 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 the joy of children. Ecclesiastes talks about this. Enjoy life. Isn't that the message of Ecclesiastes? Now remember... All things will come to a point on the day of judgment. Every thought, every act will be accounted for. 
So remember your creator in the day of your youth, but, but in a sense, enjoy your wife. Enjoy your work. This is the only life you get. Enjoy it. So there's some balance there, right? But to think that God's not good, that's, that's not true. He's very good. And he's full of love. How, how do we know he's full of love? Just go to the cross. If you want an expression of God's love, go to the cross. Put his own begotten son on the cross. That's how much he loves. <coughs> Jesus Christ was sent into the world to reign as king. And then lastly, just I only came up with ten. You can come up with more. Jesus Christ was sent into the world to reveal God's glory. He came to reveal truth, but in revealing truth of God, it reveals the glory of God. John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Kind of circle back to the whole subject of revelation. When we talk about biblical revelation that reveals the king, that reveals God, it's a, a triune work. So which member of the Trinity reveals the Godhead? And I would suggest to you, both in the Old Testament and certainly in the New Testament, through his son, it's the second member, God the Son, that reveals God. Thomas, not... If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? So the mission of God comes down to God sending his son. And in sending his son, the son, what? Sends us. And that's where we come in, in terms of missions. But you've got to see it right from the beginning. Does that make sense? Hopefully some of it did. Consider, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus the apostle and high priest who was sent to die by the mission of God. That's it in a nutshell. Father, thank you for this morning that we could be reminded of some of these gospel truths, but seeing it in the light of you, seeing it in the light of missions. The book of Hebrews is missiologically, but the, the Bible is missiological. And help us to understand it. Help us as Christians to see that we would have no salvation if you did not send your son. And that your son was a missionary. And he has called upon us to continue and to pick up, as it were, where he left off. That's X1. Help us to be uh, trained disciples. Help us to be equipped disciples. Help us to to have a burden of missions as our Lord does. And we ask this in his name. Amen.